When Joan Kroc endowed this distinguished lecture series in early 2003, it was just as the U.S. was planning to launch an invasion of Iraq. Joan was outraged, fearing that the war would do more harm than good. She picked up the phone and started making phone calls to some of the congressional leaders, urging them not to support the war. But despite her efforts and those of many of us, the war was launched on March 20th, 2003, almost three years ago. Our speaker tonight is exactly the kind of person that Joan would have loved to have seen here, someone who has a passion for and commitment to improving the condition of our species through the protection of our fundamental human rights, and someone who has not been afraid to speak truth to power. Tonight's talk by Dr. Schultz occurs at an important time for human and civil rights in this country. The Patriot Improvement and Reauthorization Act was signed by President Bush today. Before signing it, the President said, quote, as we wage the war on terror overseas, we're also going after the terrorists here at home. And one of the most important tools we have used to protect the American people is the Patriot Act. Unquote. In going through William Schultz's newest book, Tainted Legacy, 9-11, and the Ruin of Human Rights, which is going to be available in the rotunda for sale and for signing following um, the talk, uh, I am not sure that Dr. Schultz would agree with the President's perception that the Patriot Act protects American citizens. In his book, he says, it is sad that a nation that has always prided itself on its defense of the humane should now find itself the perpetrator of the repugnant. William Schultz is executive director of Amnesty International, a position that he has held since March 1994. Under his leadership, Amnesty International has grown in number of members and in influence. When one of Dr. Schultz's heroes, Dr. Carl Rogers, a founder of the humanistic psychology movement, was asked if McCarthyism had affected him personally. He said it hadn't. But he added, I've always realized that in any authoritarian takeover in this country, which I've always regarded as possible, if the dictator was smart, I would be one of the first people he should eliminate because I'm not loudly subversive, I'm deeply subversive, which is worse. So I hope you will, welc you will, you will join me in welcoming a deeply subversive, deeply caring champion of human rights who has dedicated his life to the pursuit of bettering all of our lives, Dr. William Schultz. I want to just say a brief word about Amnesty International itself before turning to the major topic of the evening. I know that some of you read The New Yorker and you're familiar with these little fillers that uh, are often uh, uh, placed at the bottom of the columns. One of my favorites was this one. Important notice. If you are one of the hundreds of parachuting enthusiasts who bought our book Skydiving Made Easy, please make the following correction. <laughs> On page 8, line 7, the words state zip code should have read pull ripcord. <laughs> now, when I, uh, when I read this, naturally, I conjured up an image of people falling through the air desperately shouting their zip codes. But, but that also reminded me that the right words at the right time really can be a matter of life and death. And that's the principle that Amnesty International has relied upon since it was founded in 1961 in Great Britain when a British barrister by the name of Peter Benenson read of two college students in uh, Portugal under a dictatorship at the time of a man named Salazar who had gone down to their local pub, raised their glasses of beer, toasted to freedom, and immediately been arrested by the secret police. And Benenson thought to himself, I wonder if some of us here in Great Britain were to write to the Portuguese government, ask for the release, would it do any good? And he put an editorial in the London Observer newspaper urging people to do that. And much to his astonishment, thousands of British citizens wrote to the Portuguese government. And the Portuguese government, which had been accustomed to doing anything it wanted to its own citizens, was dumbfounded to be receiving all of this international outrage about what they regarded as too vermin. And it let them go, or at least so the myth has it. 
And that was the seed or the germ of the idea that sometimes, by bearing witness to human rights violations, we here in San Diego can have an impact on what is going on in Jakarta, Indonesia, or Lagos, Nigeria. And since then, two million people today joined together with Amnesty around the world in more than a uh, hundred countries uh, to witness to human rights violations of all kinds certainly to the release of prisoners of conscience, but also to violations of the right to free speech or fair trial, executions, and perhaps most especially torture. You know, if I had told an ancient Greek philosopher that torture was practiced in more than half of the countries of the world today, his response would be utter astonishment. Why only half, he would say? Why not in every one? Because, of course, uh, for the ancient Greeks, uh, torture was not only acceptable, it was standard practice. But the ancient Greeks were very discriminating about who they would torture. It was only slaves, not free citizens, who could be subjected to the whip and the chain. But that was not true just because slaves were slaves. No, it, very interestingly, the reason that the Greeks believed in torturing slaves and not free citizens is because they believed that slaves did not possess the capacity of reason and hence lacked the capacity to lie. And so if you wanted to know the truth about something, all you had to do was to torture a slave who, unlike a free citizen, didn't have the mental capacity to dissemble. So the use of torture then has, since the Greeks, of course, a long history. In the Middle Ages, both civil and religious courts believed that it was unethical to convict anyone of a crime on somebody else's word alone, that the only valid evidence for thievery or for heresy uh, or for murder was a confession. And of course, what more effective way to elicit a confession than the rack and the screw? Torture was such a reputable instrument uh, that it was not until 251 years ago, 1754, that ironically Prussia, today Germany, uh, became the first country to abolish torture altogether. And then for about 150 years, torture went out of vogue. But in the 20th century, it raised its ugly head again, and now there was this difference. Whereas in ancient Greece, in medieval Europe, torture had been used solely to determine truth or to convict someone of a crime, in the 20th century, torture became an instrument of pleasure a means of intimidating your political opponents, a way to inflict pain on another person for the sheer sadistic joy of it. And I think we see in the pictures from Abu Ghraib that explicitly clear. One can't even pretend that forcing uh, naked prisoners to form a pyramid uh, or to be tethered to a leash like a dog served any purpose other than sheer humiliation. The ancient Greeks, torturers that they were, would have been ashamed of us. And torture is at the heart of Amnesty's mission. So if you want to learn more about this organization and join it, yes, step at the table, but also check out the website at amnestyusa.org. The human rights movement today faces profound challenges. I want to just mention uh, five of them and then speak to the fifth in greater detail. Uh, after President Bush's second inaugural address, this was the one in which he pledged to tie America's interests to the pursuit of freedom's cause. The Guardian newspaper in London said that President Bush's second inaugural sounded like it came from the armed wing of Amnesty International. Neoconservatives have appropriated rights language to justify American global spread. The Iraq war is now defended, now defended in the name of promoting democracy and human rights. And because no good human rights activist could have any quarrel with the notion of spreading democracy, or even with the notion of utilizing military power to take down dictators, we in the human rights community have been effectively muzzled when it comes to criticizing America's intervention in Iraq. But you don't have to be a complete cynic about the true rationale for that intervention to understand that if the pursuit of freedom's cause comes to be identified with the spread of American military and economic might, that would ultimately be a fatal blow to the notion of universal human rights. 
And so the first challenge facing the human rights community today is to take human rights back from those who would use it for narrow parochial ends. And the second challenge is to articulate the circumstances under which military intervention in the name of defending human rights is not only justified but required. If we have questions about U.S. intervention in Iraq, is that solely because that war was based upon the false premise that Hussein had weapons of mass destruction? What if, what if President Clinton had announced that the United States and its allies were undertaking military action against Saddam Hussein to stop the torture and execution of hundreds of Iraqis who were dying every year at Hussein's hands. And if intervention to stop the slaughter of Iraqis would not have been justified, well then on what grounds does virtually every human rights organization call for military intervention to stop the crimes against humanity going on today in Darfur, Sudan. The second challenge before us as a community is to establish when the world should use force to stop human rights crimes and who should do it. But of course the moment that the West uses its military might to enforce human rights laws, it lends ammunition to those in the developing world who claim that human rights are merely a disguise for Western hegemony. And so the third challenge facing the human rights movement is to refute the notion that simply because the concept of rights may have emerged out of the Enlightenment tradition, as it certainly did, that does not mean that it is not legitimate to expect those of non-Western political, cultural, or religious traditions to abide by them. The Universal Declaration, after all, was adopted by a unanimous vote of the United Nations General Assembly. Now, the suspicion with which human rights are regarded in much of the developing world reflects not only the challenge that they constitute to entrenched powers, be though, uh, those the powers of uh, dictators like President Lukashenko in Belarus or the cultural powers of those who defend practices such as female genital mutilation. No, the suspicion of human rights is generated also by the fact that without enforcement mechanisms at its disposal, international law upon which universal human rights are based is little more than a whim and a prayer. And why then ought anyone to place his or her life in the hands of such a fragile protector? So the fourth challenge before the human rights movement is to put some heft into international human rights treaties and statutes. The creation of the International Criminal Court and the growing recognition that human rights criminals like General Pinochet may well be held accountable for their crimes. These are important, but they are only steps. They are important steps, but small steps towards a world truly free of impunity. But such a world will never come into existence if the world's greatest power continues to undermine the very notion of an international community. Human rights are largely based upon what we used to call a gentleman's agreement, upon a fragile scaffolding of respect for international opinion, coupled with a desire to be seen as upholding the highest tenets of a civilized world. They require the assumption, especially on the part of the most powerful, the assumption that they too will be held accountable to the law, that just because we're powerful does not mean that we can claim a pass from being responsible. And it's that assumption, affirmed for more than 50 years by Republican and Democratic presidents alike, that has come under threat in the last five years. And this is the fifth challenge to the human rights movement, and it's the one I want to talk to you about tonight. I once read somewhere that the three most popular topics for books in the United States are sex, dogs, and Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> and when I read that, I immediately determined that I would write a book about the sex lives of Abraham Lincoln's dogs, a sure, <laughs> a sure bestseller. But the more I looked into the topic, the more I realized that the data in that area was scarce. And so I have been reduced to writing books about human rights. And this latest book, 
and the Ruin of Human Rights, Tainted Legacy, is a book that is designed to help us struggle with this fifth challenge, the, the need to find the right balance between security and liberty. When I was a, a sophomore in high school, I became acquainted with a religious movement that called itself moral rearmament. I didn't know a lot about moral rearmament, but I soon learned that practitioners of moral rearmament were required to follow four virtues, just four, but to follow those virtues without compromise. Moral rearmament practitioners were to be absolutely honest, absolutely pure, absolutely unselfish, and to display absolute love. Well, to a 14-year-old, this seemed like an eminently sensible <laughs> philosophy of life. And I decided to become a follower of those four absolute virtues. And for about 72 hours, I was. And for those 72 hours, I tried never to lie to my parents or my teachers. I tried to vanquish every impure thought from my head. I tried to be generous to a fault, but gradually it began to dawn on me that two or more absolute principles might occasionally get in each other's way. Absolute honesty, in particular, uh, seemed perpetually at odds with the other virtues. Uh, and this was brought home to me one night in a poignant fashion when an elderly relative, much beloved but notorious within the family for her bad breath, asked me to give her a big kiss on the lips. Now, which of those absolute virtues was I to follow? Absolute honesty or absolute love? And so within 72 hours, I decided that I would have to uh, reject the uh, appeal of moral rearmament, noble as it was, reject its ideas as philosophically bankrupt, and abandon them for the sake of intellectual consistency. But at a very early age, I learned the hard truth that a set of injunctions, all of which are to be enforced in equal measure, are bound to get in each other's way. And this insight about the limits of absolutes is an important one for human rights, because the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the bedrock instrument upon which human rights are based, contain more than 40 such rights. And so what are we to do if one set of rights comes in conflict with another? Uh, one of the rights in the Universal Declaration, Article 3, guarantees that everyone has the right to security of person. So that means that being safe from terrorism is not just a nice idea, it is our right as human beings. In fact, some would argue it is the most important right, because if you're dead, you can hardly exercise any of the other rights. And so what do we do if the U.S. government is correct when it says that in order to enforce Article 3, the right to security, it may have to violate, say, Article 10, which guarantees us due process if we are charged with a crime. Well, the Declaration provides some guidance. It says that in certain circumstances, in the face of threats to the public order and the general welfare, we may uh, limit rights, at least for a brief period of time. And so the question becomes, how many limitations on our rights are necessary? If we accept the position of our government, the answer is quite a few limitations. If we accept the position of we in the human rights community, the answer is virtually no limitations. But the government, on the one hand, has not stopped to consider the full implications of its compromise of human rights, not least of all the implications for the success of the war on terror itself. And I want to admit very, very quickly to you that we in the human rights movement have utterly and completely failed to articulate a strategy for fighting terrorism, that is, for protecting the right to security of person, while at the same time exercising optimal respect for all of the other rights. A few days after September 11, a young man by the name of Sheikh Melanine Ould Belai was taken into custody by the FBI. Ould Belai was the 20-year-old son of a Mauritanian diplomat. He spoke no English, the FBI provided him no translator, and so for 40 days he was shuttled between one detention center and another, and not allowed to consult a lawyer or to speak with his family. Uh, 
And then after 40 days he was finally released. He was not charged with a crime, had nothing to do with terrorism, but he was deported. The government had every right to deport him. He had overstayed his visa. Well, he had overstayed his visa because he was in FBI custody, but nonetheless, the government had every right to deport him. But before he left, Uld Belai made one very telling comment to the New York Times. I used to like the United States, he said. Now I don't understand it. I used to want to learn to speak English. Now I don't want ever to hear English spoken again. Now Uld Belai is typical of at least 1,200 foreign nationals taken into custody in the weeks following 9-11, virtually all of them Muslim. Five of them were Israeli, but the FBI didn't understand the difference between Israelis and Arabs. 1,200 foreign nationals taken into custody, in large measure deprived of access to lawyers or their family, and often manhandled, mistreated. Two weeks ago, the first civil suit of one of those taken into custody was settled by the U.S. government for $300,000. The government didn't want to take that suit to court. Ulbilai is typical of hundreds of those who are being held today as material witnesses, so-called material witnesses, virtually all of them Arab, Muslim. He's typical of five to 6,000 foreign students, all of them from Muslim countries, with the exception of those from North Korea, uh, who have been forced to register with the government fingerprinted. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we truly safer for having mistreated people who had previously looked upon this country with admiration and respect, or might that not be a surefire way to make the world more dangerous? When I was growing up in Pittsburgh in the 1960s, I was afraid, truly afraid, of just two things. I was afraid of nuclear war, and I was afraid of Tony Santaguido. Now, I was afraid of nuclear war because my parents had comfortingly assured me that when war came, Pittsburgh steel mills would be the very first target that the Russians bombed. <laughs> but when I learned in school that if I were to merely duck and cover under my wooden desk, <laughs> I would be safe from radiation, I immediately relegated nuclear war to a much lower place on my litany of worries. But that left Tony Santaguido, the neighborhood bully. One day Tony caught me with a left hook to the jaw that persuaded me on the spot to become a, a clergy person. <laughs> now, the most obvious way to have dealt with Tony, I suppose, would have been to have bloodied his nose right back. And if I had been one to do my fighting with anything other than words, I might have taken that course. But I was not confident of my skills as a pugilist. And besides, I knew that Tony had a very large family, and I suspected that if by some miracle I did manage to prevail against him, his brothers or his cousins would have sought me out and I would have been living in a world of perpetual fear that would have made the alternative of nuclear war seem welcome. <laughs> and so I settled on a different tack. I, I decided in the first place to surround myself with as large a group of my friends as possible whenever I sensed that Tony might be in the neighborhood. And I decided to reach out to two or three of the other members of Tony's gang who were not as ill-disposed toward me as he was to see if I could prevail upon them to get him to leave me alone. And much to my astonishment, after a few weeks, these dual tactics began to work. I never, I never really knew what had changed, what dynamics had changed, but I figure in retrospect that it had something to do with Casey Stengel's famous observation that the secret of a great baseball manager is to keep the two guys who hate your guts away from the three guys who at the moment are undecided about the question. <laughs> and I also figure that this little parable has a thing or two to teach us about fighting terrorism because on the face of it, the best course would have been to beat Tony Senseless. Sometimes you just have to stand up to bullies. There's nothing wrong with 
using military power, at least from a human rights perspective. Sometimes you just have to do that. Sometimes you have to go after the bad guys and get them. But as Talleyrand observed, you can do anything at all with a bayonet except to sit on it. And if I had pursued the martial course alone, and not bothering to nurture my alliances with my friends, not bothering to reach out to the more persuadable segment of Tony's retinue, the three guys who were undecided, I might have been in for a long, nasty battle. And it strikes me that our government has gotten the, the bayonet work done mighty well in the war on terror, but it keeps trying to sit on the tip. Because contrary to ill-informed right-wing opinion in the United States, the vast majority of Muslims did not applaud when the planes hit their targets on 9-11. But not only are the vast majority of Muslims keenly acquainted with poverty and corruption and disappointment, but they are also aware that the responsibility for those conditions lies squarely with their governments and with the lack of democracy, the denial of human rights, the lowly status of women in particular with its attendant waste of human resources. Unemployment, economic stagnation, widespread looting of the public treasury, these would be difficult enough for any population to bear even if it did have access to mechanisms peaceful, nonviolent mechanisms through which to regularly replace regimes or voice dissent. But of the 57 member states of the Organization of the Islamic Conference, only two, only Bangladesh and Turkey, have managed to sustain anything like democracy over an extended period of time. And so in the absence of nonviolent, democratic ways through which people can express frustration, where do they seek for political change? It's hardly surprising that they sometimes look with sympathy upon political and religious extremists who offer that most rare of commodities, an alternative vision. In this respect, President Bush is not wrong. The introduction of democracy may well be an important step in the transformation of these societies, but not the only step and not introduced the way it has been. And so the best way to persuade the three guys who are undecided about extremism, that is, the best way to persuade the millions and millions of Muslims and Arabs around the world who were not inherently ill-disposed toward the United States on uh, September uh, 11th, uh, but who indeed uh, may today uh, have a different view of our agenda, the best way to persuade them uh, to uh, counter the appeal of terrorism uh, is for the United States uh, to display eminent respect for the Islamic traditions and to be a model of respect for human rights ourselves. Uh, but I hardly need to tell you that though in our rhetoric, which has gen generally been respectful of Islam, we have taken that course, our actions have said exactly the opposite. It's not just, of course, that we have incarcerated 600 Muslims at Guantanamo Bay and held them in incommunicado detention. It's not just that we have denied to two US citizens who happen to be Muslim, Jose Padilla and Yasser Hamdi, the most fundamental rights in the US lexicon of jurisprudential rights, that is the right to know what you're charged with when you're arrested and the right to an attorney to help you defend yourself. It's not just that we have used predator missiles to carry out extrajudicial executions of five Muslims driving down a road in Yemen. Not just that we have tortured hundreds of Muslim detainees. Not just that we have rendered God knows how many of them to other countries known to use torture in their interrogation techniques. Not just all this. You know all this. It's not just all this, bad as that's been that has made it more and more difficult, if not impossible, for moderate Muslims and those who were undecided about us uh, to believe that the war on terror is indeed, as we say it is, a war in defense of freedom and the rule of law and not a war against Islam. It's also how we have prosecuted that war. It is the desecration of Korans, the uh, 
intentional violation of Islamic strictures against males having contact with women that has been played out so dramatically in reports of interrogation techniques, such as the woman guard at Guantanamo who pretended to smear her menstrual blood on a detainee. It's the sexual humiliation, the sexual humiliation of Muslims at Abu Ghraib, which is itself a devastating insult to the Islamic faith. It is the proliferation of photographs. Uh, documenting that humiliation. That's a development that, of course, has prevented the inevitable denial of mistreatment by our government, but at the same time become iconic representations of our perfidy to Muslims and others around the world. It's the fact that it was Muslim students who were singled out when students were forced to register with the government. It's the fact that the FBI acknowledged just a few weeks ago that it had regularly conducted radiation tests around Muslim mosques here in the United States, even though it had no particular evidence that a mosque was involved with dirty bombs or terrorism. It's the fact that respectable leaders like Brandon Mayfield, the Portland, Oregon lawyer, who was wrongfully accused of being associated with the Madrid bombing, just happened to have converted to Islam. And it's the company we keep every time we cozy up to the Saudi royal family concerned as we are for the flow of oil, we alienate those moderate Muslims who know that for many Saudi leaders, uh, corruption is a, a fact of life. And that in Saudi Arabia, any Muslim who objects to the form of Islam, practiced there, Wahhabism, uh, any Muslim who objects to it can himself or herself be considered an infidel, a blasphemer, and even executed. Every time we allow the Chinese, our economic allies, to get away with persecuting Muslim Uyghurs in the western provinces of China in the name of fighting terrorism, allow them to cite U.S. practices in the war on terror as justification for their actions, every time we do all this, we turn white the hair of even our most ardent Muslim supporters. And we play right into bin Laden's hands, for we appear to confirm his claim that we only follow the rules when it's convenient, that we care for nobody but ourselves, and are in fact not out to build a world in which those of every faith can be honored, but a world in which only America and its allies hold the purse strings and the power. Well, what can we do all this? Well, let me offer seven suggestions. The first thing we can do is that every single one of us can learn how to refute the ticking bomb argument. The notion that is expressed in one form or another that torture may be bad, but sometimes it is necessary to protect us. Ask how people know that. Ask them to document that torture has ever kept us safer. Ask them to prove that that, in fact, is a defensible proposition and that information obtained under torture is not, in fact, among the most unreliable in the world. The second thing we can do is to remind American officials in one form or another that we live in a new world, that General Pinochet is today under house arrest for alleged crimes against humanity that it is no longer unthinkable that American officials, at least once they leave office, might well be accused of war crimes. Even inside the Bush Defense Department, Defense Department lawyers reminded Secretary Rumsfeld and others that they might indeed be laying themselves open to post-office legal prosecution. Let's remind them of that. Third, let's close Guantanamo Bay. This may not be something that you think likely, but let me remind you that Senator Mel Martinez, Republican of Florida, has been calling for the closure of Guantanamo Bay for almost a year. And the more Guantanamo Bay becomes a symbol of American recalcitrance, the more damage its existence does to other aspects of American foreign policy. Fourth, every one of us, let's reach out to our local Muslim communities under threat. Many of us did this immediately in the months following 9-11, but uh, since then, when it has been needed most, there has often been far less connection and contact. 
let's reach out to that community. Fifth, we must insist that Congress monitor and enforce the McCain anti-torture amendment. Because we know that when President Bush signed that piece of legislation, his signing order contained reference to the fact that he would enforce that and practice that legislation only to the extent he regarded it as consistent with his presidential authority. In other words, not at all. The Army Field Manual, which the McCain Anti-Torture Amendment establishes as the standard, the baseline for all interrogation, is about to be revised by the administration. Congress must insist on enforcement of the law. Sixthly, sixth, let's outlaw extraordinary renditions. The practice of transferring prisoners from this country to other countries like Morocco and Egypt that are notorious for their use of torture. Congressman Markey of Massachusetts has introduced legislation to that effect. And American human rights groups intend to make the outlawing of extraordinary rendition the focus of an unprecedented joint effort on our part. The seventh, let's encourage the military and the religious communities in particular to speak out against torture. The military has been among the most effective segments of our population in supporting McCain's anti-torture amendment, but the religious community has been strangely silent. If there is any issue that calls out for moral outrage on the part of our religious leaders, it is this one. And let's, those of us who are in the pews of those congregations, insist that our leaders speak out. And finally, a bonus point, let's everyone here join Amnesty International and support the Joan Crock <laughs> Institute for Peace and Justice. Now, let me say finally that terrorism is the antithesis of respect for human rights. And I want to acknowledge publicly that the human rights movement has done far too little to put its own prestige, credibility, and resources at the service of a legitimate attempt to counter terrorism. Human rights advocates ought to be in the lead in insisting on an international treaty against terrorism. We ought to be using our research resources to expose those who finance terrorism, to name the names of those governments which collaborate with terrorist groups. It may well be necessary, at least for a time, for some of us to reconcile ourselves to things like national identification cards. Human rights advocates have an obligation to work with the government, not just always to criticize it, to find the right balance between security and liberty. And similarly, the government needs to kind, come finally to the recognition that the protection of fundamental human rights, like the right to due process or the right not to be tortured, that these are pathways to a safer world, key elements in the struggle to defeat terrorism. Because you don't stop terrorism by sitting on your bayonet. You stop it by using your bayonet, your power, wisely and sparingly and fairly. A man named Shumi escaped the Nazis. He escaped from his small village in Poland just before the Gestapo entered the town. He escaped, but just barely. And when, after the war, he and a relative returned to his village, six Gentile children taunted him. Look, look, they said, the dead Jews have come back to life. The dead Jews have come back. But Shumi didn't retreat in the face of those taunts. Quite the contrary. He stood his ground with patience and dignity, even reached out to those children, used to pat their heads, began to tell them stories, stories about what the village had been like before the Nazis came. And eventually, the whole village looked forward to his return. And finally, when Shumi died, it was the six children who had taunted him, those six Gentile children. They were the ones who said Kaddish. <laughs>
the Jewish prayer for the dead. They were the ones who said Kaddish at his grave. Human rights emerge, you know, out of the common misery of humankind. They give voice to the deepest yearnings of the human spirit, yearnings for things like the reconciliation of adversaries, for things like a just distribution of the earth's abundance. During the Rwandan genocide of 94, a militiaman and his troops entered a girls' school in the middle of the night, ordered the little girls out into the courtyard ordered them to separate themselves, Hutu on one side, Tutsi on the other, so that the Tutsi girls could be killed. But none of the girls moved. And a second time, the militia commander ordered them, Hutu over there, Tutsi over there, and still not a one of the girls moved. And finally, one little girl, terrified, raised her hand, and she said, I'm sorry, sir. We cannot separate ourselves. Because, you see, we here, we are not Hutu. We are not Tutsi. We are just little girls, little Rwandan girls, at which point every one of the girls was slaughtered. But what a legacy they leave. We are not Hutu. We are not Tutsi. We are just little girls, little Rwandan girls. Human rights help us to recognize evil. They teach us that every one of our bodies will perish eventually, but they teach us that evil will perish too. They teach us how to recognize evil and how to combat it. And they teach us one thing more. They teach us to be modest in the use of our power. The religious leader Lao Tzu said, conduct every one of your triumphs as if they were funerals. If human rights have anything to teach us about fighting terrorism, it is this, that we should defend well everything that we cherish, our loved ones, our property, our way of life, yes, defend it well. But that we must remember that it is only a generous heart that makes what we cherish worth defending in the first place. And what the world most admires about America, you know this, is not its military power, not its economic might, not even our entrepreneurial spirit. What the world most admires about this country is the vision it at least theoretically seeks to embody of a country that protects immigrants, that respects minorities, and that guarantees due process not to the good guys, guarantees due process to the most evil and heinous ones among us. Betray all that. We betray. You know this. We betray one of the most powerful resources we have at our hands with which to fight terrorism. Betray all that, and no one will say Kaddish at our graves. They will dance upon them. Well, I think, I think America is better than that. I think we can make that clear to the rest of the world. And I know that our future and our safety depend upon our doing so. Thank you very much. So we'll take some of your questions. But in order to get started, I'd like to ask, one of the things you said early on was you mentioned, you mentioned the, the importance of language and of the use of language and of being careful about it. Um, and, and you talked a great deal about terrorists and terrorism. And one of the things that troubles some of us um, at the Institute who work in countries like Nepal and Uganda, where uh, the US has declared the rebel movements terrorists, is the notion of the use of the word to alienate, to dehumanize, and to somehow uh, make it all right for those governments to oppress and terrorize their citizens. And so I, I wonder if you might address that. 
Yes, this is exactly why we need an international treaty on terrorism. We need a commonly agreed definition of terrorism exactly in order that that word cannot be misused, exactly in order that it be used in a proper context with attacks upon civilian populations for religious or political purposes. If we lack that, in the, la in the absence of such a commonly agreed definition, Terrorism, like other words, Holocaust, for example, will be uh, used uh, in any number of ways for purely political and partisan purposes, or as you say, Joyce, to uh, intimidate uh, or to uh, discredit or to dehumanize one particular group or population. Uh, that can stop, but we in the human rights movement need to insist it stop through the creation of an internationally agreed treaty on terrorism. Thank you. A uh, question from the audience. What can we do to protect women in American prisons who are routinely raped and intimidated, I think, by prison guards? Is this an issue for Amnesty International? Well, I thank you for this question because just this past week, uh, as some of you may know, Amnesty issued a, a very comprehensive report on all 50 states and their practices with regard to the treatment of women in U.S. prisons. And of course, as we know, the population in U.S. prisons has grown very significantly over the last uh, few years with the draconian drug laws that have been instituted in so many places. In 1999, Amnesty uh, undertook its first such study and we determined that in 14 states it was not even a crime for prison guards to have sexual relations with women prisoners. And we uh, undertook a campaign in those 14 states to change uh, the legislation there. We were successful in 13 of them. It's a crime today everywhere except in one state, the most liberal state in the nation, uh, Vermont. Uh, but uh, in all other states, it's a crime uh, for prison guards to have sexual relations with prisoners, which uh, is usually with women prisoners. But what this latest study has uh, discovered is that uh, in the enforcement of those laws, too often uh, the women prisoners themselves uh, are punished for the reporting of such harassment. In uh, 20 some states, women prisoners who harass, uh, who report harassment or sexual abuse of some kind are forced to spend 30 days in isolation, ostensibly for their protection, but you and I well know that that is a profound negative reinforcement to the notion that they will report these kinds of crimes. And so Amnesty now, having exposed this, is prepared uh, to change the legislation as needed and to uh, in incorporate uh, various kinds of oversight of its enforcement in all uh, 49 states where legislation exists. I might also say that this report will be of interest to some of you because it also reveals that in all but two states it is still legal to shackle pregnant women prisoners during labor up to the point of delivery. Unbelievable in this country. I'm proud to say that Illinois and California are the two states where it's not legal to do that. What is your opinion about the uh, Danish cartoon scandal in terms of human rights? Well, I have to say that I have very little sympathy for uh, the Danish cartoonists, uh, not because I don't believe that they had the right to do what they wanted. Uh, I have the right to tell you that I think you're ugly and stupid. But there are many circumstances under which I may decide not to exercise that right. And uh, this is a circumstance under which uh, I think enormous hypocrisy was displayed, given that we know that the particular journal, uh, magazine, or newspaper uh, had rejected other uh, such cartoons uh, that were uh, offensive to Christians. Uh, and uh, I think that we simply have to reach a point uh, in our world where we understand that while we certainly defend uh, all of our rights, uh, we don't exercise them in all circumstances where they may be harmful to others. Now this is not for a moment to defend the reaction, uh, certainly the reactions of violence within the Muslim world. It is not for a moment to say that Muslims have responsibility for excising uh, cartoons that are regularly displayed in uh, uh, Arab uh, publications that are quite offensive to Jewish uh, people. 
uh, that uh, absolutely is, is entirely unacceptable for exactly the same reasons. But in my judgment, uh, the uh, defense uh, of the action of the Danish press and others who then duplicated that on the basis of free speech really misses the point. Thank you. What would you suggest be done about the major U.S. corporations who support oppressive regimes by providing information to them about dissidents? I'm referring to Yahoo in this instance. And then it goes on, in Nazi Germany, large corporations like IBM were instrumental in enabling the Nazi regime to locate and round up Jews and others for the concentration camps. There's no question that corporations bear very significant responsibility in the countries where they operate uh, for uh, the ways in which their particular the resources they provide and their practices may or may not contribute to human rights violations. Amnesty International is currently in conversation with Microsoft in an effort to persuade Microsoft to establish a code of best practices. Uh, and at the very least, such a code would hold that uh, companies, uh, internet uh, service providing companies, would not collaborate with repressive governments in the provision of information about their users uh, that would send those uh, users to jail. Uh, this is not for a moment to suggest that Microsoft, Google, or anyone else shouldn't operate in these countries. We know that there are uh, legitimately uh, defended benefits to having greater communication. It is very important that uh, the Chinese people be able to, uh, to communicate with one another and with the outside world and vice versa. Uh, but it is also important that these uh, companies exercise a certain restraint and responsibility, and I'm hopeful that we will be able to make some progress in this respect. What can be our response when people like Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld basically dismiss out of hand reports by Amnesty International? Well, our, our response is very simple. We, uh, uh, we remind Secretary Rumsfeld that he was all too happy to cite Amnesty's reports in the run-up to the Iraq War and uh, believed that Amnesty was entirely accurate in its criticisms of Saddam Hussein's regime and uh, more than happy to uh, utilize those. Uh, the Secretary, of course, uh, becomes far less enthusiastic about uh, Amnesty's reports when it has to do with the United States' own practices or its allies, but I think uh, the world can tell uh, who, is a, uh, who is a hypocrite and who is not. Thank you. You stated that the promotion of human rights sometimes requires military might, which will invariably cause human rights violations. How then is the position that torture is sometimes necessary to protect the human rights or freedoms of Americans also required Mm, sorry, I'm having trouble reading it. Um, can you adhere to just war theory but not to just torture concept? Well, let me be very clear about this. One uh, can be a pacifist and a human rights advocate, but one can be a human rights advocate and not necessarily be a pacifist. It is certainly true that most wars, I'm willing to acknowledge all wars, entail some human rights violations. There is no question about that. None of our hands are completely clean. In my personal judgment, uh, I'm not a pacifist. Uh, I respect those who are. In my judgment, there are certain circumstances, uh, certainly the Rwandan genocide being one, where in order to protect uh, more people than uh, those who will be harmed because of military combat, it is justified. Uh, to uh, engage in uh, military action in defense of the innocent. Uh, I think this is very different from the question of torture. Uh, military action in and of itself has never been outlawed. I guess it was with the Breon Treaty years ago, but uh, certainly today under international law, it is not inherently a violation of law to engage in military combat. It is a violation to engage in certain forms of military combat, but military combat itself is not a violation of uh, international law. On the other hand, torture is under all circumstances a violation of international law. 
In my judgment, as I've just said, it is not inherently a violation of moral law, inherently, to engage in military combat, depending, of course, upon the reasons and the circumstances. It is, under all circumstances, in my opinion, a violation of moral law to engage in torture. Uh, I would make these two distinctions. I don't know whether I should note this, but the person clapping the loudest is one of our loyal supporters who is a former Navy captain. And I think that, and I think that in recognizing that, it goes to what you were saying a little earlier that we talked about, which is that the military are the ones who are the most embarrassed and ashamed at what is happening right now at Abu Ghraib in Guantanamo. How do you rate... How do you rate the record of the United Nations human rights uh, to date, and what recommendation would you make to those involved in the current effort to reform and reshape it? There's absolutely no question that the United Nations Human Rights Commission, as it has been currently uh, constituted, is uh, fundamentally uh, an abysmal failure. It has been successful in terms of some of the special rapporteurs who have been appointed by the Council, uh, and certainly the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, especially when it was uh, held by Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland, uh, has played an important role. But as currently constituted uh, in a way that allows regimes like Libya and Sudan, which are clear human rights violators, to be not only members of the Council, but leaders of the Council, uh, the Council uh, is an ineffective instrument. Kofi Annan proposed a very significant reform of uh, the council. In the past, council members, uh, member states, uh, had been chosen regionally. Uh, the Secretary General pro proposed that they be chosen by a two-thirds vote of the General Assembly. Uh, other reforms that he initiated was that the records of all member states of the United Nations were to be regularly reviewed, reviewed at least annually, including those who were members of the Human Rights Commission, or Council, as it is to be called. And he proposed that the Council be able to meet at least three times a year, not the one time that the current Commission does, and even be able to meet upon call with special circumstances and crises. Now, currently, the United Nations is debating this issue. And there were uh, changes made in Secretary uh, General Annan's proposal, such that uh, today uh, the proposal before the UN is that a majority of member states of the General Assembly, not two-thirds, elect the member countries to the council, the new council, the proposed new council. And the United States is opposing the resolution. It is the only significant country in the world to oppose the resolution. John Bolton is leading the charge uh, against this resolution. Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and most other human rights organizations, despite our recognition that we didn't get everything we wanted in the current proposal, are supporting it. We believe that there is good reason to think that this proposal, while far from perfect, will be a vast improvement upon the current Human Rights Commission. And our hope is to be able to persuade the United States to at least uh, stand neutral on this question and not to continue its opposition. So with that, I would like to offer a small token of our appreciation to Dr. Schultz. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you. Thank you.